going to talk about something that um, I'm very delighted to hear that none of you have a problem with. Um, you never encounter it. Uh, so if you pull out the outline, you'll know what I'm talking about this morning, and that's how to win over temptation. How to win over temptation. And um, we're going to talk about probably the oldest problem in, in the world to mankind. In fact, uh, how many of you know where the first temptation was? In Genesis, right? In the garden, right? Nice setting. Beautiful place. So, who was tempted? Both of them. Both of them, right? Eve first, then Adam, correct? What was the temptation? They ate of the tree that they were forbidden to eat from, right? But what was it? Was it was it an apple? A fig? The tree of knowledge? What kind of fruit is that, I wonder? My point being, if you think about it, and traditionally we say that they were tempted with an apple or some type of fruit, not the tree itself of good and evil, but a fruit bearing from that particular tree. Are you with me? And so when you think of temptation, we all have to deal with it, but oftentimes we think about temptation as about sex, drugs, alcohol, rock and roll. I mean, it's all about that kind of stuff. Normally when you say, I'm tempted, I'm tempted with this. Some people deal with pornography. Some people deal with all kinds of different things. That's the norm. But I want you to just think for a moment because when we're talking about temptation, it can be an apple. Are you with me? It can be sugar. It can be anything that you don't control, but that controls you in life. And so we're going to kind of talk about that today, and I'm going to give you some ways to deal with it. But I thought about this, I was praying about it, and I thought, wow, temptation. Oscar Wilde, he said something really, he said uh, an interesting quote, I'll quote it to you. I can withstand anything except temptation. <laughs> and the only way to get out of it is to succumb to it. <laughs> Not the right solution, correct? But that's, that's what he has. So let me read James chapter 1, verse 12. It said, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. The only way to get rid of it, or it says afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now notice that. God blesses those who patiently endure testing. I'm not going to ask you right now what testing you're going through, but I guarantee you that 90% of us in this room are being tested. You're going through something. It may be a big deal. It could be a health issue. It could be a back issue for me. It could be a surgery. It could be a job. It could be work. It could be a home. It could be your kids. The, the list goes on and on. It could be the school, the school district, goofy parents. I mean, there's all these things you deal with in life that are tests. The other part of that, though, is temptations. Temptations. And they come in all sizes and all shapes when we talk about temptations. But James says this, there's a prize and there's a reward for each one of us as we endure the testing and the temptations that come our way. Pretty interesting, isn't it? In other words, they're going to be there. So the question is, how do you and I handle temptations? How do, we, how do we handle tests that come our way and trials that come our way? So that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. And so Roman numeral number one is be realistic. Be realistic. You've got to face the facts. All of us will be tempted in some way, some shape, some form. For me, uh, a real simple kind of thing is when uh, my chiropractor first noticed in an x-ray that my, my spine was inflamed, all the nerve endings were inflamed. And I, I've told you this before, but he said, um, 
For two weeks, I want you to give up all grain, all dairy, and all sugar. And I thought to myself, I'll never eat again. <laughs> what other foods do we have to choose from? <laughs> an egg. I get an egg, or I get a steak, or I get a piece of meat. And so for me personally, as many of you know, after many, many years, I'm an ice cream fanatic. I like b and I like, I like Haagen-Dazs. I like all the great... And one, you know, one little teeny tiny pint of ice cream? Well, it's not how much it is. It's look how much sugar, sugar is in just a pint of ice cream. So I had to make a decision and I said, you mean I, no more oatmeal? No oatmeal. What about protein powder? No, nope, no protein powder. I said, whoa, man because that's whey protein, right? So God was testing me, and the temptation was always there, dealing with the simplicity of food. And more than anything, to be honest with you, sugar. I love sugar. I'll tell you one other thing. A glass of skim milk has 11 grams of sugar in skim milk. I had to stop drinking milk. Now, you don't think much about that, but I will tell you something in my personal life. That was a real test. Now, what if I had some ice cream? Was I going to go to hell? No. Does God really care if Bill has ice cream or not? Are, are you following my, my, my thinking here? It's the simplicity of life, choices that we make what's really good for us and what is not good for us. It's not always, again, sex and all this other stuff and alcohol and drugs and the things we normally think that we got to stop that because those are temptations. Life is filled with them at every step, basically, we take. So we need to be realistic. It's not if we get tempted, it's when. It's not when you get tested. You know you're going to be. And so be realistic. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you. But what's it say? But what except is common to man? All temptation that you and I deal with is common to man. You and I don't have a temptation or a test that's unique. We might think we're unique, but it's to everybody. You talk to somebody and they're going through the same thing you are. Same problem you are. You can identify with it. So we need to be realistic when it comes to testing and, and temptation and trials that you and I are going to go through. And the other thing is it's common to man. That means we all go through it, plain and simple. Same temptation, same problems. And um, incidentally, it's not a sin to be tempted. The sin comes when you fall to the temptation, whatever that might be. And so that's very important. Now, number two, be responsible. Be responsible. James talks about you and I be responsible accept the responsibility that we have. When we go through tests and trials and temptations, we have to be responsible for the decisions that we make. One of the things that's interesting, in our culture today, we always blame somebody else for what we're going through. It's, it's the blame game. Uh, it doesn't matter. Instead of us being responsible for our own lives, we blame somebody else for the decisions that we're going to make. We blame somebody else for our past. We blame somebody else for where we were raised, whatever it is. Instead of saying, hey, hold on a minute. I'm the one responsible for me. I'm not going to blame my dad. I'm not going to blame my mother. I'm not going to blame my cousin. I'm not going to blame that I'm a poor bum. I'm, I, I, life is life. And so we need to take responsibility for those things in life that we encounter, right? So James 1, 13 says, when tempted... No one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone else. So what's important, we don't blame God. We understand that the evil one is everything. When, when a test comes, I don't care what it is, its purpose is to separate you from God. And in, in other words, take your eyes off of God and get it onto the temptation or the problem. That's the bottom line of the whole entire thing. It's to, it's to shift your focus. 
A temptation, a test, or a trial is to shift your focus off of God continuously and onto the test, the trial, or the temptation. And your eyes are there all the time. Then the enemy is getting his way because you're not focusing on the love of God, the purposes of God in your life. Does that make sense to everybody? And so we have to understand that. I, I love this. Um, I lived in Oklahoma, and Will Rogers was well-known. Everybody know who Will Rogers was? Yeah, yeah. He said this. Will Rogers said, you can sum up the American history by two great movements, the passing of the buffalo and the passing of the buck. <laughs> Pass off all of our problems on somebody else. So we're in a blame game society. Don't get caught up in that. Take responsibility for everything that goes on in your life. Don't look to somebody else as the solution or the cause of your problem. Are you with me on that? Very important. Number three, be ready. Temptation is going to come your way. A test is going to come your way. A trial, whether you want it or not, is going to come your way. And it can come in the form of your children, Again, work, it could come at school, it, it could come anywhere, at any place, at any time. So you have to be ready for it. And so this is what I do, and I tell you this, I've told you this for years, and I encourage everybody in this room to do it, Ephesians 6.10. If you're going to be ready, you better be ready every day, and do not leave home without your spiritual armor. Do not walk out the door without your spiritual armor. When I'm in my lazy boy chair in the morning and it's dark and I get up and I wish it was sunshiny and beautiful and all that nonsense, it's dark. I haven't even started to have a cup of coffee yet. One of the first things I do is put on my spiritual armor. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. I gird my loins with the truth, John 8:32, because the truth does what? It sets you free. You want to gird your loins with freedom in Jesus Christ. I put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect my heart because out of the overflow of the heart, what happens? My mouth, my mouth speaks. So I got to be careful about that. I take the shield of faith in my left hand, the sword of the spirit, the power of almighty God in my right hand. Amen. I place upon my feet the gospel of peace because everywhere I go that day, if it's just sitting in my house, walking from one room to the other, I'm taking the good news of Jesus Christ with me to the bathroom, to the kitchen, to the bedroom, out the door, in my truck, wherever I go. That makes sense? And very importantly, put on the helmet of salvation. Ask God to protect your mind, your thoughts, your memory, your recall, everything. Have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 I want the mind of Jesus Christ, not Bill Hill's mind. Amen. I'm putting that helmet on. Amen. Why? I have to be ready and prepared for each and every new day that comes my way. Are you with me on that? Yes. You see, so we got to be prepared. we got to be ready. We have to put on the armor. It says this in James 1.14. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. Don't be deceived, dear brothers. And then I think I may even made a note about circling that word deceived. Don't, don't be deceived. You want to circle that. And so we need to prepare ourselves for temptation. So how do we prepare ourselves? We need to understand how temptation operates. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, we must be not, we must, we are not aware of his schemes. Satan can't outwit, outwit us, pardon me. We have to be aware of how the devil operates. It, it's, it's real simple. And so temptation, incidentally, is a process. It's a process. So I'm going to walk you through that. The first step of temptation is desire. All right? The first step of temptation is desire. I sit in my office, and I'm done. I've had dinner. I'm sitting in my room. Weird things happen. I think about ice cream. <laughs> I'll just be honest with you. I'm sorry. It's weird. I'm watching something. I'm watching Discovery or 
don't watch the Food Channel. That's very, <laughs> that's a real dangerous one to get into. I'm serious. I'm just sitting there, just, I am had a delightful dinner. My wife makes a great dinner for me, and I'm sitting there relaxing, and it just, boom, pops into my mind. A little haagen ice cream. Whoa. I think I have three scoops. And you start thinking about it, right? It's not harmful. I'm not going to go again to hell for having ice cream. But here's how temptation works. A desire is thrown your way. And I don't care what the desire is, but it comes your way. James 1, 14 says, each one is tempted when by his own evil desires or what have you. Most desires are okay, but some desires can be taken out of control, totally out of control. So we have to understand that and they can be destructive. Number two, the second step is deception, being deceived. James 1 says, he is dragged away and enticed. Now notice that, dragged away and enticed. The word dragged away simply means you fall into a trap. You fall into a trap. May not seem to be a big deal, but you end up falling into a trap. And uh, incidentally, you can write this down, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. You all know this anyway, but the early disciples, what did they do for a living? What? What? They were fishermen, right? And you notice that James talks in terms of a fisherman. Because the word enticed is the same as throwing a lure in front of you. What's a lure? Something you'll bite into that you'll take. It's deception. One of the things I like to fish, as you all know, um, usually when I go fishing, I have at least seven rods on deck with seven totally different, completely different lures. And in my tackle box, I have 12 tackle boxes filled with grubs, tubes, worms, plugs, several hundred lures, several hundred. I'm not kidding. You know why? I don't know what lure will tempt the fish that day. I don't know. So I got to throw everything I can in front of his face to get him to bite as I tempt him. Are you with me? And it's the same way when we have temptation. Satan will throw a lure that he wants you to bite on. And then what happens? He'll get you hooked. Plain and simple. That's how temptation works. This, this, that's, how it, that's how it happens. And number three is disobedience. Once you bite in and you're hooked, you've disobeyed. So you get enticed, you get entrapped, all that. And James 1.15 says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to what? Sin. It gives birth to sin. What begins in our mind is then put into action. And that's where it all happens. In your mind, it's still okay. But then when you put it into action, it is no longer okay. It turns into sin, whatever that might be. And it moves from thoughts to action. Um, if you're interested, I, I'm already working on another series um, for next year called Battle for Our Minds. I taught it seven, eight years ago. And... Uh, if you think it would be something you'd be interested in, I'll continue to pursue it. I'm rewriting it. But we have to understand that everything starts where? It doesn't start in my hands. My action does not start in my feet. My obedience or disobedience starts where? Right here. In my mind. So I'm preparing a series again to... Give us a deeper understanding of all of that, too. Biblically, what does the Word of God say? Because we don't want to disobey. We want to obey, right? We don't want to fall into some kind of a trap. And number four, all of it leads to death. And when I talk about death, I'm talking about spiritual death. So when we get into sin and temptation and all of that, 
the end result is James 1.15 says, Sin, when full grown, gives birth to death. And it's talking about spiritual death. And unfortunately, some sin can lead to physical death. Opioids. Drug addiction. That can lead to death. Alcoholism. Could lead to death, right? There's a lot of things that can lead to death. Not only spiritual, but actually physical if we succumb to the temptation, right? Are you with me? Now, number four, one of the solutions to all of this is be refocused. Be refocused. Change how you think. It's a, it's a principle called the principle of replacement. When you refocus, you're replacing one thought for another thought, okay? You're taking control of the negative thought, and you want to turn it into a positive thought. So you're refocusing, you're, re, you're rethinking. It's, again, for me, um, uh, well, let's just say, I'll be honest with you, dealing with pain. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm, so, I'm so thankful for your prayers Amen. and praying for me each and every day. I cannot begin to tell you I thank God for your prayers. And every morning... I don't care if I, if I don't feel as well as I want to, if my back is hurting me more than I want it to, if my legs aren't working and I stand up too long and my legs get numb. All this junk happens. Debbie's there shaking her head with me. She knows what we're going through. I proclaim John 8, 32. Lord, thank you. I am free from pain. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For the prayers of the saints that have freed me from my pain. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And then I name you. Amen. I changed my focus from pain to healing. Amen. Are, Amen. Okay, is this, is, this, is this making sense? You got to refocus. You got you, you to gotta change your attention point and get it off the problem and onto the solution. Right? That's, that's how I win over tem uh, all these temptations and all these tests and all these trials. That's how we win. Amen. Biblically, that's how we win. You put on the armor and you change your mindset. You, you refocus. It, it's, it's real simple. Philippians 4.8. Think on these things. Things that are good, positive, just, and honest. And so, whatever gets your attention, that's what kind of drives you. And again, uh, Psalms 34.1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. Now, you want to change a negative into a positive, follow that scripture. Follow the word of God. At all times, I'll praise him and I'll thank him for the answer, for the solution. And for his love, his grace, his mercy, his kindness, his goodness, his joy, his peace. That's just surrounding and it's just overwhelming me. And it overwhelms you. That's what it's all about. That's what this whole thing is about. Another thing, you might want to write this down. When temptation calls, don't answer. <laughs> Pretty profound, isn't it? It's, it's unbelievable. And lastly, be reborn. Be reborn. It's a, it's a simple thing. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anybody will open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. Sometimes we have to re-invite Christ back into our life. Amen. You know, if nothing else, reassure ourselves that he is dwelling within that in fact I do have Christ within the hope of glory. He's there. In Acts 2.38, yeah, I'll repent. I will be baptized by full immersion. And I will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Those are positive things. Being reborn. And allowing God to come into our life and have total, complete control. And lastly, 1 Corinthians 10.13, God is faithful... He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. 
but with when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up underneath it. Hopefully, I've given you the way out. I've given you the solution to the problem. Now all you have to do is do it. And I will be calling each one of you. <laughs> Did you do it today? All right, I just want to check on you, make sure you follow my instructions. <laughs> oh, brother, it's something else, isn't it? God is so good. Oh, uh, I meet with my surgeon. Terry, just my wife, reminded me. I, I meet with my surgeon Thursday. He's going to go over the procedure with me and his expectations of my recovery time. Um, and then I actually have a, the surgery a week from Tuesday. So September 29th. Uh, October, pardon me. October. September, October. Is this 2020 or 2019? Okay, well, whatever. It's not 2018. Okay, all right, not 18, uh, you know. But uh, it'll be a week from this coming Tuesday. Um, I know that they're taking out two cysts. I know I'm going to have to have two fusions in my vertebrae, uh, a laminectomy, um, uh, clean out all the arthritis, all of the... Uh, uh, calcium deposits. He's going to have to clean out a whole bunch of stuff in there. And um, what's interesting too is uh, he's, no, most back surgeries, they make one slice in your back. Uh, for mine, he's got to make two. He's got to enter two separate ways to, uh, to get what he wants to get. Um, he's going to take a pair of pliers and <laughs> a screwdriver <laughs> and a drill. Anyway, it's going to be a delightful time. Um, I'll tell you the honest truth, too. My expectation is I will be here that Sunday anyway. Amen. That's my expectation. Surgery on Tuesday, I'll be back here teaching on Sunday. Amen. And so that's with, that's with your prayer. Amen. That's with you praying for me, me praying for you. Amen. I depend on your prayers for me. Amen. I depend on it. And I can tell. I'm just going to let you know. I can tell the difference as you continually pray for me. Amen. God is so good, isn't he? Amen. And we win over temptation, don't we? Right. We'll win. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that you have given us uh, a biblical way to win over temptation. Anything that comes our way, anything that comes our way, we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And by, Father, your word alive in our lives. So we give you praise. We give you glory and thanksgiving for this time and for this word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name.